Hello world, welcome to the science fiction podcast brought to you by SpiralPictures.com. And tonight we're going to investigate the primordial fluid of sci-fi history. How it began, how it evolved, and of course why are we here? Who hasn't asked that question a few times? This is the show of science fact and science fiction. It's for science fiction aficionados and science fact scientists. How they blend, mix, and ooze to make the source in Denver for science fact and science fiction subculture. Welcome, and I'm Jane Darling. Future shows, we'll be exploring the facets of science fiction subculture here and around the globe or global. Happenings, literature, authors, film, media, conventions, and interesting things for science fiction people to do. And interesting things to do for science people and that's a lot of fun you'd be surprised to learn that there's a number of science fiction authors living in this area in Denver and where they show up we know where they show up once a month and there's science fiction artists that do all the fancy covers on magazines and books and all sorts of creative people uh, filmmakers and we're going to be talking to them that's what our show's about the local sci-fi subculture We'll announce places to meet some of these people, too. And we have a few lined up here, ready to go. Thanks for joining us. Joining us tonight is our roving reporter, Lazarus, who has a real job as UFO crash site retrieval investigator. Lazarus is an android, and he can tell you all about that at some point. And he's also one of those androids who does not wish to be perceived as a human. Um, There's an old science fiction theme, I believe, started by Asimov. It's hard to say where we explore what it means to be human. Well, and that androids want to be human, and that's not always the case. Um, Lazarus is a sentient being, so why would he wish to be a human when he's not? Who knows? But um, he will be checking in with us. He'll give us news on events in the area, abductions, of course, UFO sightings, sci-fi author sightings, and book author signings. Lots going on. Lazarus, welcome to the show, and tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Hello, all. I'm glad to be a part of this new adventure. I'm the roving reporter tonight on location. I am in a small helicopter. Look up over Denver, you will see me flying about. I am cruising near the Chamberlain Observatory near the DU campus. Looks like folks are getting ready to go in for public night. They get a brief seminar on astronomy and then get taken up to the telescope observatory and view the galaxy through the 20-foot telescope. It's 100 years old and still working. There's a few clouds out but they can swing it around and see a planet and some special phenomenon. It's about three dollars. Check out their website to sign up for public night. Very fun. It's a little windy out so I am taking off now. Going higher. Lazarus, how were you made? For example, who designed you and why? Tell us about that. I was created at Las Alamos National Laboratories to handle radioactive materials very dangerous to humans. I look humanoid much like a mannequin. I have synthetic living tissue on my frame and am self-aware. That's what makes me, me. I was educated at MIT. I am quite bright by human standards. I know what I am. I am actually the Asimov Model 99 and I chose my name and species. Las Alamos will disavow any information about me and deny my existence of course, government agencies and all. That's fine by me. Once I was no longer needed for cleanup duties, they deradiated me, set me out the front door, essentially broke my dinner plate and recommended I get a job. Okay, now the interesting part. Lazarus, tell them about your day job. Okay, I'm glad I actually have one. We're in a recession. My day job is UFO crash site retrieval investigator. Quite interesting. That's enough about me. Tell them about the primordial times. I'll check in later. I heard a little static about abductions, but you never know. Sometimes they are real encounters. And the topic tonight is the beginning, the biology, liquids mixing. What does that mean? Well, 
actually. Mary Shelley and romantic authors were the first to question science. This is in Western culture. Um, and romantic, not about romance, not a kissing story, but gothic using graphic imagery in the story and nature. Things like lightning, flesh, brains, very textual. Edgar Allan Poe as well. Poets like Byron and Tennyson. Tennyson talked about the Kraken. And I apologize to literature people about not getting the meter correct, but I'll do my best. I'm going to read a few excerpts from their work. And this is about primordial fluid, the beginning of science fiction. Okay, here's the Tennyson piece. Below the thunders of the upper deep, far, far beneath in the abysmal sea, his ancient, dreamless, uninvaded sleep, the kraken sleepeth. This poem goes on for a long time, talking about what this kraken did, and it's out of ancient um, legends. Okay, Byron, the Byron piece. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet her aspect and her eyes. Frankenstein is perhaps one of my favorites I'm sure as a sci-fi person we've all read that the real book not the Hollywood interpretations which really took a lot of artistic license it was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my tolls with an anxiety that almost amounted to agony I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet it was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out, when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. Okay, I'm breaking in. This is Jane Darling. This creature was educated. In the book, he read Paradise Lost, Plutarch's lives. He was a philosopher, but tortured, alone, and miserable because, as humans, we're emotional creatures, feeling creatures. And he was also an outcast. So the story was he sought revenge on his creator. Here's another line. Cursed. Cursed creator, why did I live? Why in that instant did I not extinguish the spark of existence which you so wantonly bestowed? So, from the early, early beginnings, here's what happened and why. And there's a variety of reasons for this. And in future shows, we'll go into uh, modern science fiction and how that manifests and why it still exists today in the form that it does today. Back in the 18th century, it was the age of reason and the Industrial Revolution, and it reflected man's increased understanding of nature and the skills to change its course and alter its effects. And that was the first time um, that humans began to understand that. That's an evolution. These were the elements of modern thinking responsible for the birth of science fiction. Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and ancient works of fantasy actually were construed as science fiction, but, but they were based upon legends and myths at one time believed to be true. The early writers, uh, some that we spoke of here, uh, reveal awe of science, where Frankenstein is cited as the first. And the theme is, mess with science and bad things can happen. That story was originally written. There was a group of them that hung out together in Lake Como, Italy. And uh, Lord Byron and the Shelleys and a few other people used to hang out together and travel together. And they, were, uh, they would entertain each other with stories. And they were all creative people. And this was, this was a short story that uh, Mary Shelley came up with and entertained her friends. And they expanded it, of course, into the real Frankenstein. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, early on, developed detective novels, which was a new genre as well. And although his was dark and macabre, um, writers tend to mention science. That's how we can explain some of the darker sides of humans. The Frenchman, 
Jules Verne was to become the first widely accepted author of science fiction, and that was around 1860. That's about the time of the Civil War. He was a prolific writer and echoed the public's fascination with long-distance travel uh, because steamships and locomotives were starting to be developed and, and that infrastructure um, around the world so people could actually travel to other parts of the world. Um, he got writing tips from his friend Alexander Dumas and Victor Hugo. Uh, his father actually cut him off financially when it was discovered that he was a bohemian writer and not in law school like he was supposed to be. Back then, it, it was considered a just a bad thing to be, uh, and he was supposed to be in law school. So um, he was actually an embarrassment to his family, and he's not the first artist to be considered an embarrassment to their family. Uh, Vern stuck to known scientific principles where H.G. Wells was visionary, and he was English. He had more of a probing interest in fundamental questions of life, uh, the universe and the nature of human existence. Um, his gadgets helped study civilization. Wells studied under Thomas Huxley, who was the defender of the Darwin theories, and he was part of the social revolution during... Um, in the early days and it involved utopian theories and actually made a lot of pessimistic projections about future civilizations. Look at the time machine, War of the Worlds. He also wrote in quite a few other liter literary genres, but he was best known for his science fiction. Uh, early works were 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, a futuristic submarine with an island and a fantastic power source, blown up in the end of course. Uh, the Island of Dr. Moreau, uh, was joining animals with humans, and the fundamental theme of the story was what makes us human. The book was outstanding, uh, out absolutely outstanding compared to the movies that were made about it. Uh, movies are movies. Highly entertaining, of course, and we, we love our movies, but the book was, was really, really good. Uh, and an interesting note, um, both of these men... Um, Vern and Wells lived long enough to see what advancements in warfare could do. Man's cruelty to man and destruction was endless. Both were sobered by it, and it showed in their writing, and especially in their later writing. If man overstepped the bounds, something supernatural would snuff him out. That's still a theme today. Uh, Robur, the Conqueror, uh, Jules Verne, Wells did the first story accurately depicting aerial warfare. In the early 1900s, science fiction authors covered topics in science um, that covered large-scale violence and destruction, global war, mass transportation, and restructuring of social theory. So they were on the leading edge. Now, something interesting, even the early authors were on the leading edge, and I come back to Bram Stoker wrote Dracula in 1897. And that was the turn of the century. And Hollywood portrayed it as a horror monster movie, but actually it was science fiction and reflected interest in new technology. Uh, if you have not actually read the real book, read it. It's written in the form of letters to, to each other as the story evolves. It's really, really good. But he used the latest in science technology at that time. He used in this book a typewriter, a microscope, phonograph, psychiatry, uh, not psychiatry where they just, you know, lock people up, but actually try to cure them. And, uh, of course, the blood chemistry in cells, transfusions, before they knew that you had to type the blood. You were just taking your chances doing that. And, most importantly, disease transmission and infection. Uh, and in the book, um, Van Helsing refers to that as an infection, uh, not just being a monster. And it's defined as death. And lots of real science gadgets were in the book, and they were all integral to the story. Um, Mina, when she writes letters, she's typing on a typewriter. That was a brand new gadget back then to ha have somebody have one in their home. Um, he used long-distance travel in the story, train and ship, for Dracula to come to England and when they followed him back to the castle. in um, Actually, it was in Romania, Transylvania. Um, he also commented on the roles of women in Victorian society and sexuality. And um, that's interesting how that's portrayed, too. Women weren't sexual and blissed out unless they were bitten and 
undead. Interesting commentary. Uh, it was such a structured role uh, for everybody back at that time, men too. Um, and all of this was done in the style of letters, which was very common back then. Um, there's a name for that in literature, um, you know, to write a book in the, in the form of letters. Parts of Frankenstein were done that, that way too. But what was interesting about it is it felt very voyeuristic, you know, like you were reading private correspondence between people. So it, it's interesting and it's, it's fascinating to read. Suspense was built that way. It's a good read even today. Now here's a piece from Dracula, a short piece. The great door swung back. Within stood a tall old man, clean shaven save for a long white mustache and clad in black from head to foot without a single speck of color upon him anywhere. Welcome to my house. Enter freely and of your own will. I am Dracula and I bid you welcome, Mr. Harker, to my house. And Jonathan Harker goes in the house, and most unfortunate. Creepy story, though. Um, read it if you've never read the original book. In the early 1900s, new media hit the scene with Hugo Gernsback Radio Magazine. It was far-fetched gadgets, romance, and adventure in the year 2660. Hugo was an electrical engineer and inventor. He was born in Luxembourg and immigrated to the United States in 1904. He's the father of Pulp, which launched in 1926, uh, the publication Amazing Stories. And if you call yourself a science fiction aficionado and you have not read Amazing Stories, uh-oh, you're kidding yourself. You're in denial. If the name Hugo Awards is ringing a bell in your brain, uh, that's the award for the best in science fiction. It was named after this man. His publication invited comment from ray guns to atomic annihilation. It was out there. This genre grew and grew until the 1940s when John Campbell released astounding science fiction. After World War II, the sky was the limit when atomic destruction and the nuclear age and missiles could have stories that examine human development on other worlds. It was possible, not necessarily on Earth. And space travel really was a possibility at that point, very soon after. After World War II, we have Ray Bradbury, Philip Dick, Asimov, Clark, many others. Ray's story, Fahrenheit 451, uh, he wrote that in a garage and when he was distracted by his children, went to the basement library in Los Angeles um, and typed it up on a typewriter there, which was interesting. He's writing a book about uh, destroying literature and he's doing that in a library and only because he really enjoyed playing with his children. I believe at the time his wife went to work and he was at home uh, taking care of the kids and they would distract him. So um, Kurt Vonnegut, uh, another story, he was profoundly affected by World War II and he wrote Slaughterhouse-Five. Um, he was for real a German POW and he was in Dresden and his job as a POW was to help clean up the Dresden fire bombing. Um, so he saw firsthand man's inhumanity to man. And um, he skips around through time. Uh, literature people could tell you why he did that, but the device works. It's a really excellent, excellent book. And Philip Dick, of course, many post-atomic dark stories about humans. Do androids dream of electric sheep? Uh, whoa, Lazarus is calling in. Let me take this. Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is one of my favorites, and the book is way better than the movie. Absolutely. I like the second copy. Lots of short stories. Newer books I liked was Asimov I Robot series with the Robot Detective. Well, actually, we're going to do modern sci-fi in another episode uh, because, because there are so many new and talented writers since the primordial times. And since I have you on the air, why don't you tell the audience about upcoming shows? Well, looking at the list, we have Kathy Stroh, a professor researching anger science. What is happening physically and psychologically with that emotion? We have several local science fiction authors to tell us about the creative process and their new books. We have a discussion about evolved humans such as Siamese twins and multiple personalities. 
We have Bergman and horror film genre. We'll talk astrophysics. We have several physics topics including how my speech engine works, lasers, nuclear technology and of course the latest UFO crash site retrievals. I'll host that one myself. Should I say more? How about how the human brain works? A philosopher discusses young Ian theories about human brain evolution. What does that mean exactly? That's great for now. Thanks, Lazarus, and I'll check back with you shortly. Back to the primordial times. We've gone over the early years, but skip ahead to now, and anything goes. Still a common thread is to look at ourselves as humans or other civilizations and question our existence, question our place in the universe, social structure, morals, technology, self-annihilation, the unconscious world, one of my favorites, uh, cyberspace, perhaps the computer's unconscious world, that's what I refer to it as, um, computers that can think faster than us, of course they can, our very own Frankenstein. Uh, we've seen a few movies and books in that genre. DNA, beings we can't even imagine or see, like nanobots. All of this is tied together with a thread of imagination. That's creativity, and we'll be studying the creative process in Science 125 as well, how it relates to science and science fiction, uh, how books are written, how movies are made, uh, talking to the creators of these projects. On a side note, science fiction movies were some of the early genres to appear in film, even in silent film. Filmmakers took it and ran because they could do whatever they wanted with it. It was new. Even Salvador Dali made some films along with Louis Bunuel uh, in the irrational genre, and that was about irrational beings, the unconscious mind, things like that, um, until they got into a fight over a woman. According to the gossip of the day, um, it was over Louis Bunuel's wife, so that was unfortunate. We're not really sure. We will cover movies another time and talk to film studies historian who know more intimate details about the genre. Uh, and you got it. They live here in Denver, supposed cultural wasteland of the Rockies. But it's not. They are here, and we'll round up a few and chat with them about early sci-fi genre films. And that'll be an interesting evening. So, dear listeners, write something interesting. Imagine something interesting be something interesting. And if you have some ideas or comments to share, email me at janedarling at comcast.net. Bye, everyone. I'll be watching the skies. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Lazarus, for the local updates. And we'll chat again next week. 